Okay, thank you all. Um, we're back, and right before we launch into the next inner circle, I want to just say a few quick things. Um, so the first is, can I have everyone's attention? Thank you. So the first is that we're trying to mark a little bit like the bright spots, the things that are working that folks are mentioning throughout these conversations. Of course, we're taking like all the notes, but also if there are things that uh, like specific companies, artists, things that come to you that you just want uh, us to have, feel free to write on these big sticky notes um, throughout our time together. We all, I also want to acknowledge that we asked folks to share artists that you recommended and whose work you thought uh, everyone should know about before you came. A reminder that that list is being aggregated. It's on the convening webpage as a PDF with links to everybody. And so we're also happy to add any additional uh, folks who you want to add to that list at any time. And a good way for us to know would be to put them uh, on those stickies. Um, great. So before we launch in, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Lonnie, who's going to, uh, you know, get us back together with a moment of movement before we begin inner circle number two. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, if you can and want to, would you join me on your feet? Folks in the inner circle, if you want to be there, you can. If you want to step out for a moment, you can. Whatever you want. Um, so yeah, uh, as we go, do what's comfortable for your body. Take care of yourself. Sit if you need to. Um, so I just wanted to uh, do something that would help us maybe relieve a little tension, because I know that I'm holding a lot of tension right now. Um, <laughs> so if we just ro uh, kind of jump back and forth on our feet. My feet are my feet are lift, are leaving the ground because it's a little more fun. But if you can't, if you don't want to, that's totally fine. Um, yeah, and so just like you're rubbing your hair against a balloon, think of this as like making friction. Right now, you're making friction with the ground, and from it, that friction is is all of your tension and all of your rage and all of the things that you're holding on to that are dragging you down today, and maybe not just today, but forever. And then you're building it up, building it up, building it up, building up, and you're gonna let it out in one huge, loud, silly, weird sound, and a crazy motion with your body, all together. We're gonna do it when I count to five. And we're gonna do this three times, yes, three whole times. So here we go. One, two, build it up, build the friction. Three, four, five. And now I'm not going to count. We're just going to do it together. And it's going to be great. And you're going to build it. And we're just going to feel it. And you can do whatever you need to do to build this friction. If you feel like getting some knee action in there, if you want to sit on the floor and scoot your butt on it, do whatever you need to do. And we're going to build it up together. And then we're just going to let the sound out. We're going to feel it out. OK, here we go. dissipating. <laughs> Come on, we got to keep the energy going. We have to do this one more time after this. Here we go. Yeah, build it up, build it up, build it up, build it up. Okay, increasing helps. Yeah, one more time, really. Okay. <laughs> now make this one really weird, really silly. All right, here we go. One last time. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's a workout. <laughs> they never do this if we were Thank you, Lani. Okay. So as I said at the outset, there's this, um, the conversation was structured uh, to build the, a cumulative one. And so we're the group uh, now that is looking at how do we, the, the actual question is how do we double our impact? How do we double our current impact? So there's gonna be another group that thinks about the stars, that thinks about you know, paradigm changes, 
But in the work of what's happening right now, how might we imagine doubling, even go to triple, if, you, if you, that's easier, um, the impact of the work that you're doing, that others are doing. One of the things that I heard in the first circle that we didn't get a chance to poke at is this notion of uh, networks and recognizing that practice is local. Is there value in uh, organizing? Is there potential in organizing? That's one thing I'd like to hear about. But what other um, avenues for increasing impact in your personal practice or in your community or in our collective practice? Chantal, did you have a, a place you wanted to begin for yourself? I think so. I'm thinking about Abhishek's example of the um, theater that travels to six different villages and that uses the environment as the backdrop for this play. And I'm wondering, what is it that we're, we're already doing that maybe could travel with very few resources and could be replicated? That could go either, either travel, actually, or be uh, done in a different location, but using the same model. Like, are there things that we already have that could s scale as opposed to I mean, we can also invent new things, mm -hmm. but I wonder, are there things that we already have that we could um, bump up? Mm -hmm. And are, are there, uh, talk about even the notion of scaling. Is that something that resonates as a, as a potential place to begin for everybody or for some, for anyone? Yeah, Rob. Um, in this theme of thinking about things sort of holistically about, so where these problems have arisen from, you know, that we're facing climate change certainly being the most probably acute of our sustainability problems, but by no means the only one, mm -hmm. with the common um, sort of uh, pathos that, that has given rise to this. It, they happen, these are emergent phenomena, right? I mean, we don't intend for these things to happen. Um, the systems that we've created have, have brought us uh, sort of in a, have achieved their own sort of coherence to bring us to this, and resonance to bring us to this level of, of challenge and damage and urgency. And this is a feature of complex systems. Um, but human society itself is a complex system in the way we respond. And so I think you can also, there's this exponential growth that happens when things start to hit a resonance. And that can also happen for the positive. And, um, this notion of, of what's working that came up last time is I think a lot of this is working and it doesn't always feel like things are happening. But um, that's kind of a feature of exponential growth mm -hmm. and of these emergent systems is it feels like nothing's happening and then all of a sudden it is. It explodes. And so I think this notion of scaling up is more a question of achieving a kind of a coherence in the efforts. Okay. So, just like the, um, you know, biologists, I'm sure many of you have heard of these really fabulous things. Work that, here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. These really amazing things that happen, like in, the, in Brazil, they look at, uh, I know there's been a study on fireflies that, that start to, um, they illuminate uh, in resonance across miles of the river. And that's not because they've gotten together in a committee and decided that this is how we're going to do it. It's, a, it's an emergent phenomenon. The same thing happens in lots of places. And, mm -hmm in nature, and I think with these kinds of efforts, with societal efforts, that happens as well. We've very recently seen it with, for example, marriage equality and, and um, this whole discussion mm -hmm. in our society, which for decades seemed to be going nowhere, and then all of a sudden, massive. Because beneath, beneath the surface, lots of things have been happening. So I think uh, on this notion of scaling up, this notion of sort of replicating, producing, creating things that can happen with a coherent future feature, meaning they have sort of the same goals. So an effort um, just doing the same things, but in many more places, mm -hmm. and not necessarily controlled by the same people, but maybe seeded by the same people. Mm -hmm. um, There's an element also of uh, visibility and coherence, or, or, a, or a commonality, and something about making something um, 
seem like a system that right now may seem like a lot of local things. Right. So that that's the di kind of the difference between uh, maybe noise and actual uh, useful action. So when two waves are hit the same place in their cycle at the same time, mm -hmm. that's coherent. When the waves are just not happening in any way the same, you know, raindrops hitting a pond are just mm -hmm. noise. The ripples mm -hmm. they produce are noise. But if you slap the pond in a constant way, you can produce huge waves with tiny slaps mm -hmm. if you do it at the right rate. Okay. And so I think this it's not necessarily that everything has to, um, the same people have to be doing it, but it has to be happening with the same common shared mm -hmm. goal. Um, mm -hmm. And if those seeds can be planted in many communities, lots of regional theaters and community theaters and, and artistic, uh, where there's, there's a shared goal, then I think what the efforts that emerge that are working towards a shared goal will have a coherence that right. start to amplify each other much beyond any one of their own. Great. Kyoko, what are you thinking? Um, um, I agree um, to many things that we've been talking about um, and I think that in order to scale uh, we need to you know we can't just create one wonderful um, you know uh, theater production that's addressing the the uh, um, um, climate challenge climate change directly, but we, for example, I was, I had like three things written down. Um, so for, um, for example, okay, sorry, I don't know w where to start, but yeah. for example, going back to um, the uh, traveling th theater mm -hmm. ritual model, mm -hmm. um, in Japan, um, there is a contemporary, um, artist who's been engaged in um, socially engaged art. And to me, it's almost like recreating the traditional um, folk arts or the rituals that existed, but maybe um, um, extinct. Uh, but she's doing it with her contemporary music uh, composition mm -hmm. and involving the villagers and uh, working on the theme of, uh, of uh, environment, for example. So to engage more people to really, um, you know, uh, make that, make that uh, uh, community involvement. And one strategy I think is, just like we were talking about humor earlier, that to, because, you know, to, to look cool, <laughs> <laughs> to, 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 you know, uh, young people in, um, are interested in fashion, for example, and a lot of contemporary artists are good at that. And again, I'm talking about Japan a little bit more, but traditionally, artists were seen as who are different, who think differently. And in societies like Japan, where it's rather um, less, much less diverse and more in general conservative, it's in important uh, to have that um, kind of like a, like a freedom given that, oh, oh, she's an artist, so she's doing something mm. very different. So that's going back to a little bit to what we were talking about, about the strength mm -hmm. that we have. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that came to me is um, early education. So, um, you know, uh, the theater production, some of them, um, may not seem like for children, but then with the um, expert educator, um, it could be interpreted and it could be highlighted what in this existing production is about environment. It could be, um, you know, made into an uh, educational tool, mm -hmm. for example, because mm -hmm. I really think early education slash exposure to um, that concept, um, again, in Japan, it's um, traditional um, uh, belief, uh, religious belief, is how we call yao yorozu no kami, which means eight million gods, so the, or, or the spirits. So stone from leaf to tree to everything has spirit and they're respected. So 
you know, there's mm -hmm. there's a like a nature, the, the, the respect for nature is embedded. Mm -hmm. So um, so something like that, not saying that everybody has to convert to that uh, uh, Aboriginal Shinto, but but some that kind of value that we are talking about here, uh, which may be missing in um, missing a lot in um, the current uh, um, um, advanced societies, the like because of our economy is really based on consumption. Yeah. Um, so something like that. <coughs> the last thing I was thinking about the um, intersectional collaboration. And this is, I really appreciate um, this conference is involving or inviting scientists. Um, and in the art sector, I think we've been talking about, um, you know, working with cross sector. However, it hasn't been happening as much as it could. And I think, I'm, again, I'm, I'm very impressed that we are really talking together in one group. But I also think that we want to involve like psychologists or uh, comparative study scholars mm -hmm. um, to advance this kind of uh, um, uh, thinking together. Great. So there are a number of things in there um, embedded early um, as, a, as a way to increase impact. We were talking in the earlier circle much more about adult audiences, and this is a conversation all of a sudden now about, well, get, get young, <laughs> start it young. Uh, the uh, notion of intersectionality as starting from the beginning, like a, a beginning place to double impact. What other things are maybe um, on your mind about how to increase the impact of what it is that you're doing individually or that we're doing as a global community? <coughs> There's also the notion of, of embedding a, a sense of nature, of spirit, of uh, you know, moving outside of the human-centric nature of our stories. Yeah, Marta. Um, oh, well, let's get her in the back. Oh, okay. um, I just want to say I'm grateful for the, now I want to say indigenization of things and the Shintoization of things, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's really mm -hmm. important. Um, one thing that I'm grappling with, and maybe others have solutions, and I'd love to talk to you, is I think about, I think about artists and arts folks and just often the impulse of, of creation and which embedded in it often is the idea of creating something new. And once that newness is there, most of the people that I know and work with, we don't, we're not the kind of species that wants to keep doing it. We want to do something else or go deeper or some kind of variation of that. And the reason I mention that is because when we're talking about scaling, there's a kind of thing that has to do with repetition. You know, and that's one thing that's, that's embedded in science, too, is good science allows you to, requires that you are able to replicate the experiment. Um, and we don't, in the arts, it's often we have to be unique. That's what we're supposed to be doing in, in a lot of the old Western ways of thinking about it. But so, so often what I'm trying to say is, I guess, could there be a way that when we think about the infrastructure, I'm thinking about what Roberto was talking about, and I really value wherever you are, um, what you were you know, how do, we make, how do we move it? How do we scale it? Is there a way that there could be a new profession, or maybe it exists, um, that can take that initial production or that initial, initial way of working and, and translate it so that it can be adapted to educators or politicians or urban planners or whatever it is so that the artist can keep doing new things or the things that the artists are really great at doing, Steve and then, Jones. sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'll good, just, good, good. I'll just good. intersect good. for one yeah, second yeah, and good. just say, you, there's a lot of educators in the room, and I know that it's uh, not natural to just talk to some of the group no, no, and no, not no, the no. whole group, but, but it's actually really, quite I'm a powerful. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, ahead. thank you, right. But, th but so that there's a, there's a different species, I mean, that, that there's some other kind of person in there that helps to create a new life or a longer life for things that are initiated by artists or theater mm -hmm. makers mm -hmm. in, a, in a larger sphere. Chantal, you. So to follow exactly on what you said, Marta, I wonder if, um, like, yes, maybe there's another species, or is, or is it a way for us to document what we do that can then be passed on? You know, like, as opposed to bringing something, somebody else, like, I wonder, 
Is there something we can do that we would be good at that then we could pass on and it could continue to live without needing our input? So um, the, que the question asks um, us to double and um, double what? Our impact. What's our impact and who's we? So let's just think about those things for a second, right? So we can't double what we can't measure, and I'm not even sure, right? Have we measured? What's the question? What, what are we trying to impact? Are we trying to save a particular endangered species? Are we trying to save some cities from um, going under? Are we trying to protect famine? Are we trying to, what, what are we trying to do? So what kind of impact are we trying to have at the end of the day? So that's, I think, the, the most important question to ask isn't uh, how we, but it's why we, right? Why are we doing this? And in many ways, I think what I'm really focused on is that big word, human. And I think that word got there because we're probably talking about the human impacts of climate change, right? That's probably why the word is so huge there. But um, to go to your idea of, you know, not um, re-traumatizing, I, I do a lot of work about endangered animals. It's probably the biggest thing I do, rebuilding habitats and taking care of animals. But I really don't care about that. I care about humans doing that. Because I think what we're trying to do is build a better human being, right? So first question is, what are we trying to do? Like, what is it that we are measuring here? So there's a practice where um, the artist is a teacher and a student at the same time, right? So we're both in it together. We're working and learning together. So that's one thing I think all of us can look at. So when we say we, who's we? Is we, you know, the, the producer? Is we the playwright? Is we the audience? Or is we the Joseph Boys sort of we, which is everyone's an artist? So I think that's the first question we need to ask ourselves. And then we talk about impact. Well, what is it that we're trying to do? Because there's different kinds of activism. I am particularly involved with a kind of activism called slow activism, right? Okay. I'm, I'm not trying to change the problem immediately, even though there's a sense of urgency. I'm actually trying to, little by little, build systems, work in an ecosystem to change those things. So that, to, to go to you about the newness of something, we, I'm not trying to create new art, I'm trying to create a group of individuals who work together. So I'm more of a choreographer than a painter when I do my eco art, right? So it's working with the policymakers and the different schools and the science museum, everyone working together to try to get to this idea of learning from one another. And I think what the people in this room have is creativity, right? The ability to innovate or do something new. And that's what I call the making it weird thing. So you do something that looks unusual, but just reframes the way you think about something that's in front of you that then serves as a catalyst for people to try to respond to that problem. And then you give them a sense of ownership and they get engaged. So the question is a hard one because it's, it could be answered in a hundred ways. And part of what I have difficulty with is us understanding what we're trying to impact. So I think if we could, if we're, we started this, this idea with a sense of urgency, right? Like we need to do something. So I need to understand who we is and what that something is. And, and I think that's part of, part of what this discussion can, can be about. Uh, there's a, um, I, don't, I don't know anything about physics, so I use these words at my peril, but um, there's, you know, uh, chaos theory um, seems to me to describe a sense of, of uh, there are many different things happening and we haven't seen the system yet. Uh, and I wonder to what extent people um, feel th the need to come to one system, to, to agree on a single impact or to, to agree on a practice or a we or a project, um, and to what degree, to your earlier point, is it, is it raindrops or is it many um, people you know, making small waves <laughs> that yeah. somehow um, cohere. What, do you, do people, do, where do you, you have a sense of that? Here, Elena. So I, um, I guess I'm pulling from everybody who spoke so far, but I think one of the ways that we can double our impact is to empower um, 
all of our all of our people within our communities into action rather than um, like like what was said earlier about the deficit. But I think because a lot of times we get people in the political realms or people who are the directors of theaters or you know whatever it is that we say you know oh they need to be people of color or they need to be this and that. But then sometimes they can be just as damaging as the <coughs> you know, non-people of color that have sat in positions and they could be just as damaging because they don't get what we're trying to build. And so I think it's really important to build each other up and help each other to, um, to be able to sit in those positions. So then leaving the door open um, for people who may not even know that they're artists or that they um, are, you know, in theater. And because I think a lot of people who are in politics, a lot of people who are in you know, artist in, in any kind of theater work, it's, it's they kind of self-proclaim, right? And then so the people who don't feel that they carry those characteristics, then they just sit on the outside and don't, um, they don't know what they could be or how big of a difference they could make. So really building up our people, because we have a lot of hardworking people that um, could trump talent any day, you know, <laughs> within um, our communities that just don't know that they're artists, or don't don't know that they're actors, don't know that their um, their calling could be theater. Um, and I'm just thinking of the systems or the interdisciplinary um, view of it because we could work fluidly to change climate, um, to change our impact on climate, but how many of our marginalized communities know about the carbon counter or you know, or know what that even means? You know, this many tons and wait, you know, unless it's some people are visual, some people just understand that stuff out of just because they do. Um, and I think I like what, what you were, um, sorry, Chantal. <laughs> Chantal, I like what you said too, because I think a lot of the work that we do, we're, people have conversations and then we're like, all right, yeah, I would love to do this, this, and this, and you've already done that, you know, I wanna learn, and they're like, yeah, you should, you should, you, you encourage them, but then they ha they're left to reinvent the wheel anyway, right? So then trying to get um, a template or some kind of um, action plan to share with people so we could make the best impact without everybody starting from ground one and needing to do it on their own. So. Don't be stingy, hey? <laughs> share resources and share knowledge. And just understanding that when we empower each other, it's not taking anything from us, it's, it's helping us to, because nobody has the minds that we have, we can empower them to do this, but they'll do it in a completely different way, no matter how much work we've done for them, they still will do it way different than we do, right? And so, yeah, anyways. Is there a, a gathering space or a, a, I mean, a virtual space, if we're talking globally, a watering hole or some a place where people are actually able to share and, and uh, that someone wants to lift here, uh, um, particularly around questions like this? Javier, you had a comment and then we'll go to Peterson. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, no, no. Javier, Teddy, and then Peterson. So my comment was just to... Um, you know, talk to you a little bit more about the the issue of of, um, of the issue of making a change of a radical change, and you were talking about how in society we've seen it happen right um, recently. So a hundred years ago, if I would have asked any of you to spit in the middle of this floor, you would, right? Societally, it would have been okay just to spit right now. I bet I can't get a single one of you to spit on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> try, try, <laughs> try. It's really hard. Okay. I mean, f go for it. <laughs> really, go. All right, good for you. Can someone else do that? <laughs> <laughs> Society, like, told us, you know, you don't spit in a barber shop because there's tuberculosis in your spit, and all of a sudden the entire American society stopped spitting in no time because it was bad, right? Like, we got it. Oh, my God, you don't do that. Congratulations, by the way. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a courage, which was your word today, right? But, but I don't know if it's a courage, but for me, that's, that's, a, pretty, that's a pretty tall order right there, right? Because it's breaking a lot, of, a lot of societal norms. What we haven't figured out is a way of telling our fellow human beings that climate change is worse than tuberculosis, and we've got to start doing stuff, right? That changes things. So what, what we have in ourselves here in this little circle are people who are real innovators, right? Like you can, you can change the worldview of the people who come to your theater. 
Like you can have them rethink their place in this world. And I think that science can do that with its journals. And there's some TV shows that have and can have that impact. But I think the power of artists is to, is to really reframe an issue and make people think differently. And that, I think, is what's gonna make the change. Because the, there's a lot of the discussion that I'm feeling as, as we're talking that sounds very much about how do I make my practice or my theater company you know, better at doing what I do. And I, I think that may be the wrong question, right? It's really a, it's a bigger issue that we're trying to confront at this moment. So that's what I'm getting at. It's that that's what the, I think that us here in this little circle have that ability collectively to do something really bigger than what we can do individually. And that's, I think, the challenge of the day. That's what I mean by impact. Mm -hmm. and what excites me about what you just said is I heard a goal in there too. And so like you, I saw this list of questions and was like, oh my gosh, the responsibility of how are we going to double and then triple and then plan the next 12 months. And I heard this very pragmatic estimate there. And my first mind was measurables and goals. So we've got one goal. It's, it's to recognize that we've got power of the, over the, right. we have the potential to influence the audience, to speak in dialogue with the audiences that are in our spaces, that are seeing our work, that we're educating, and the chance to garner empathy for a problem that they are a participant in. Empathy. Yeah. The other thing I just totally adore about what you keep returning to, and I think is a, is a model we can all sort of I just want to name, is that there is, it's not a zero-sum game. You said it about trauma, you said it um, here about, about the same sort of pragmatic thing about goals. It's not a zero-sum. If I'm going here, I'm not taking away from this pot. Mm -hmm. But it's really, um, as we look at things under a lens, um, that there's a potential for it to be prismatic rather than, you know, one way or the other. To offer one, to your initial question, to offer one project that, um, that I can sort of claim as a, um, a way of approaching this that we could hang our hat on. Georgetown is, we're participating in, or launching rather, a university-wide initiative that looks at problems from a um, interdisciplinary model. And the first one will be climate change. So we're very fortunate at the lab that um, one of our co-directors is going to be teaching um, one of the offerings in the humanities, um, which is a class that he's taking, or that he's teaching, it's called um, Improvisation for Social Change. And that will be introducing students from all over Georgetown um, at a way of looking not only at climate change from different perspectives that you don't have to be a capital S scientist in order to acknowledge and change it, but also a way of approaching it that the solutions um, may require thoughts from different parts of your training, different parts of your background, different parts of your person. Mm -hmm. um, so. That's one thing I can, yeah, I can great, name. Thank yeah, thank you. Peterson. Hmm. Um, a lot of things. Uh -huh. um, That's what happens when it accumulates. So that's all right. Just, yeah. just bring out what you're sitting with. We've been um, hearing about decolonizing our, our brains. And I think this also extends to our imaginations in that one of the vestiges of American colonialism in regards to climate change and the environment is that we're constantly reacting to the denial narrative um, because it was put out there. And I hear so many climate presentations where basically it's saying, see, it's really happening, which is a tremendous waste of time mm -hmm. and energy to tell people what's real. When, you know, and, and I often wonder, what if there was no climate denial? What would we be doing? Mm -hmm. What would we be saying? Mm -hmm. The other way that it's very much come out of the US and parts of Europe too, is this obsession over individual carbon footprints and turning it on individuals. And I've, this is the other, other theme I've been hearing today is about structural and systemic changes that need to take place. And it seems the environmentalist movement has been very earnest in getting people to live responsibly, but it's really systems that have to change. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think in part of decolonizing this is what happens if we throw out the denial narrative and throw out the personal carbon footprint and begin to think for our local communities, our regions, our countries, what does systemic and structural change look like? And then the other question that keeps coming up, and it's driving me mad because the answer to me is so unbelievably obvious, how do we amplify our message 
most people don't go to theater. Most people don't see live theater. Most people see YouTube and Facebook videos, and usually they're less than 30 seconds or 60 seconds long. We are artists, and we, don't, we can create art in all sorts of spaces. There are people doing stuff on the internet that need content, really good artistic stuff. I go to, in South Africa, KwaZulu-Natal, this little rural community, everyone has a smartphone, they're looking at videos. This is, like a, this is a global mm -hmm. thing in so many ways. And I think we need to push ourselves to consider how do we use these technologies to do our theater and really liberate ourselves from long form the live theater. Right, yeah, so we're hearing about changing platforms. You brought up this term narrative. Um, and we haven't talked that much about it, but you, brought, you used the word, but also uh, the notion of climate denial, or um, what was the this, the other one that you were uh, carbon footprints. These are these are really strong narratives. These are, uh, and uh, do we have a capacity or an opportunity with narrative um, as a as a group of theater makers, since that's our weapon of choice. Um, make some change here. Rob, did you have a immediate thought? I know Javier is waiting to yeah. um, um, Anybody else? I, I think that's just sort of a brilliant summary of, of a lot of things, unpackaging very succinctly. And so I think of this as what's the story, part of the way I think of it is what's the story and who's it for? And um, uh, Xavier brought up this notion of well, what's the goal? What are we trying to do? I'll summarize that for myself, and this is how I often summarize it for people I talk to, which is the goal is, is a reduction in human, is, a, is an increase in human well-being. Um, and you can, I think that's something that's really hard to argue with. <laughs> now then, of course, there are specifics. And then, uh, and, the, and, this, and the success, from my mind, from my work, and I think what the work that all of you do, to me, is moving people from uh, sort of, somebody said earlier, gaining a little bit of knowledge, in calling that a success, um, but moving us to a meaningful response. And so that's my notion of success. So what's the story um, is even regardless of the, of the medium, you just talked about long form plays or maybe one act, but now moving to video or moving to something that just has much more reach, that really resonates with me. And the story though, bringing it back to Elena's topic about not re-traumatizing is, um, this notion of vision, where are we going? What would we want? And while the, the world of, of our art culture is full of dystopic views of, of climate change and societal collapse, uh, it's not very full of uh, narratives and envisionings and stories about the place we want to be and what it would be like to be there and how we get there. And so I would say that for this group, what I look for is those stories. And then there are other people out there who will translate those stories, or, and we can help them, filmmakers and YouTube makers and playwrights and novelists. Um, there's a whole ecosystem of that kind of thing. What they need, I think, are the stories. Mm -hmm. And one last comment, this is yeah. quick. Um, the audience, um, I also resonate with the denier comment, and I, I, um, I refuse many speaking engagements in which I'm asked to debate climate change with somebody who doesn't accept the science. I really think the game is not in moving the immovable. Mm -hmm. I think the game is taking those of us who understand we have these problems to some degree. Maybe they don't, we don't under, all understand the scale and the immediacy, but who understand, who get that we have these problems, and taking those people and moving them to a place of response. I think that's the target audience for the most part. Yeah, uh, you're talking about a head tilt that um, I, I think, I just wanna put in the room this question of if we tilted the head, what would we, what would we stop doing? And stop banging, stop engaging the climate denier argument, but also stop I, the idea of who the audience is. Like what are the, what are the controlling um, assumptions we have about we or the world um, that we could just the other way, look at them a, in a different direction and drop some kind of resistance or some kind of um, impediment. Elena and then Javier. Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to make a comment about how 
how do we just continue to move forward and or in the impact and just everybody's comments I think um, what people are I believe what people are looking for is, is is they're overwhelmed I don't know if everybody's in denial but people are overwhelmed like oh great well well then I'm gonna YOLO you know <laughs> like what what do I do I don't I just well I'll just put it off till tomorrow then I'm just gonna have fun today you know because and so I think, um, because it's overwhelming and it's scary, and so I think as artists, as theater majors, as people who know better, who, who are doing better, that we basically are building the sidewalk. And we use that analogy when we, with our language work, is that um, you know, our language was taken away from us, our culture, everything. We weren't even allowed to practice our culture until 1978 when the Amer Native American Religious Freedom Act was passed. We weren't allowed to have our languages taught in our schools until 1990, and people think that this is something that is so old, you know? And I think for us, we, we deal with that too, with the language, is that um, we're, we're not gonna save, one of the uh, elder from New Zealand said that, um, you're not gonna save your language for all your people, but you are gonna save it for those who are willing to, to work with you and to save it. And so we use the analogy that this was taken from us, it was meant to be ripped from us. Each and every one of you were meant to not know anything about me or my people, and that was intentional. And so I think when it comes to climate change, same same thing, we were meant to think it was a hoax and that it's not real. And so I think we're building the sidewalk as we're walking, and we almost have to do how to, you know? It, it mixed in with our artistic, uh, abilities and identities and every all the work that we do we got to throw in these like how to so people aren't overwhelmed and they can be entertained at the same time so um but this if you know when we started earlier today you talked about the idea of being um strategic and in a sense i want to be a little bit pragmatic about how to make some systems changes and i do think that um focusing maybe not on the deniers but on the oblivious because there's a lot of people who really don't resonate or care about climate change and it's not that they're opinionated it's just that it's not their thing they're worried about paying a mortgage so what I try to do is I, might, I try to make the issue relevant to their mortgage so in Miami which as you know where I live has serious issues with people's mortgages because they're going to be underwater in more ways than one right I reframe the issue and make it about them. Really, like, this is about your house. I know you don't care about the manatee. I'm having you care about your house. So I think that their stories or the storytelling or the way of framing it is about creating consensus and creating community around uh, not the people who are gonna walk into my gallery or to your theater, but to the broader community, but using the tools that we have uh, in my gallery and your theater to reach broader community. So I think that's that's one way I, I, I try to do it. The second thing I try to do in changing systems is um, literally building a cadre of people who teach, like you were just talking about just a second ago, the idea of the how-to, right? So the how-to care and love, you know, their environment or care and understand that we're all going to have to leave Miami one day so that we can start preparing for Miami going under. So I um, explained to them that they've done this before. I'm from a family of political refugees that left everything behind because of an external force. And the grandchildren of those same people are about to leave everything behind because of an external force. So I'm able to create discussions between political refugees, present day and future climate refugees, using art, using these mm -hmm. techniques that I use. So my point is it's just trying to figure out you know, what it is you're trying to do. In this case, I'm trying to navigate through the chaos, have people understand that we have to have some equity for the people who are gonna lose their houses because they're gonna be underwater, most of them poor people in the Everglades portion. Everyone thinks it's the Atlantic Ocean, but the Everglades is also water. So those people will suffer. And reframing issues around that is, is how I try to um, get systems to change because I'm not gonna get the politicians in Miami to do anything unless there's this groundswell of support. So it's this very complicated thing we try to do, engaging all these policymakers and people. So I engage the school system, the museums, everybody involved 
in order to have these conversations. And I think that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying like impact. What, what are we trying to do here? Yeah, uh, we're at time here. We're gonna open the circle out. And uh, I know Peterson, I see your hand there. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, take, go back to the uh, Love your outer circle. <laughs> Here. So those of you who've been listening, circle, take a moment to <coughs> connect. Connect with yourself about what's on your head coming out of that. Peterson, did you have a follow-up that you want to go to? And then we'll start to work the rest of the circle. When I think about climate change, I think often about the early HIV AIDS crisis and the parallels that exist there and the absolute need for theatrical activism that took place. And the, the, I mean, those political actions of ACT UP in particular and groups like that, this was theater that they were doing. And, um, and in order to change systems, we have to put pressure on the, on the public. And it's not just enough to be angry and to, to, you know, to say that, but at really it, it is like putting on a play. Like what is, what is the message and how are we gonna you know, do it in a theatrical way so that the, the media, in the way that they report stories, they'll pick up on that message. Um, and, and so I think that uh, we're so sorely needed in helping engaging with activists who are on the streets with the skills that we have, including people who do design. I, again, I think about the, the really creative stuff that they did with ACT UP and design is so essential to that and costumes and all of that. And so in a way, we're, I, I feel like we're being called to, to up the ante in that way and, and bring it out to the streets and, and, and help shape the public message. Jayesha, can I um, pull on you around um, Cryuan? I understand that that's your that, that's a project you were uh, your company was involved with, and maybe as a no, did I get that wrong? That's not a company, but yeah, we co-produced Okay, great. Yeah, could you could you talk about it, just as a follow up to Peterson's on the ACT UP world? What was what is Cryuan, and what are what are, has been your sense of the impact of Cryuan? Um, so Cryuan is a site-specific processional journey that started in 2013. Um, I wasn't part of it at that point. I experienced it at that point when I was a coalition coordinator for 96 organizations across the Gulf Coast. Um, and the piece at that time was a four-hour processional through the wetlands of Louisiana. It's a story about coastal land loss, um, environmental racism, all the issues that we face in the Gulf Coast. Um, I became part of that project. We toured it around while I was part, that coalition existed in the response to the BP oil disaster. Um, the coalition no longer exists after the settlement um, happened. But we went and we uh, combined parts of the theater piece, some films that were being shown at, that were kind of came out at that time about the issues in our communities and some lives like storytelling story circles and then community visioning and then i did a little like policy presentation about like what was happening at that time with the restore act which was the act that uh was around the bp oil disaster so that was one piece and then it closed uh last year in the fall in gentilly which is my neighborhood so one mile from my home we closed the piece and that was where we another gulf is possible which is a collaborative of brown women across the gulf coast we were co-producers and partners in developing the kind of last iteration, which was a shorter piece, it was two hours, um, and we partnered with the city of New Orleans, and the, there was this big you know, water initiative happening in our city because of the water that we have to deal with, and so this is a big water reclamation site that hadn't yet started, so the piece was on that site that is gonna be a multi-billion dollar, I believe, water reclamation project to live with the water and not against it, and so we took the piece there. I produced some visual installations that were kind of the end of the processional ended with these visioning pieces that were different kinds of visual installations for the audience to kind of take it on. And so the impact, um, there's a film that Working Films has helped to co-produce 
that hopefully that film can, because people keep wanting it, but it, it takes a lot to produce that, and so I don't think the whole production will ever be shown again, but how can this piece continue to live via what uh, folks were saying in terms of like, what are other platforms that theater can live on in, and so we're thinking about that film piece, marrying it with other film, like some animations that we're creating in another gulf as possible, so thinking about the longer term strategies that that theater can continue to live on even though we're not going to be producing the live performance again. We're trying to think of ways to continue to organize with the content moving forward. Mm -hmm. Very helpful, thank you. Uh, there was a hand, Marta, was your hand up a moment? This is kind of off topic, but I kind of on, and, and combining the things about doubling impact. And I think about a couple of, well, three examples maybe. The, fir the first one is um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, <laughs> which I recently read because I talk about it a lot and I thought, oh, I think it'd be good to read this. Um, but what was so interesting about it, it's not the greatest work of art, um, for sure. But um, as Lincoln said supposedly to Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote it, you know, oh, you're the little lady, or you wrote the book that started the Civil War, which she didn't do, of course, but she um, did work on the, build on the work of other abolitionists and all kinds of other people, and she captured the imagination of the American people to envision a world without slavery and sort of how to get there. And I, the reason I'm mentioning this is because I feel like um, there are some examples of artists partnering with other people um, that have been, other, other kinds of disciplines that have been really impactful, one of which is um, uh, Eve Mosier, I'm sorry, these are visual artist examples. Eve Mosier, who who did the um, the blue the waterline project, I think it was called. Is that the name of it? High water. Thank you. Um, and and um, it's a project where she she worked with scientists to trace the lines originally in Miami um, of where the storm surge line, the flood line, would come um, in Manhattan. And she's done it in different communities. Um, so people could visualize and visceralize where that water is going to be coming. And her most I think one of her most successful projects of that artwork was in Miami, where she partnered with Heidi Quant, who's an activist and whose skills are community activism. And together, they really, really galvanized the community to come together and to write a big Kellogg Foundation grant, I think it was, to, to, to create a disaster plan to um, and hazard resilience plan for that area. And, and that's one example of, I think, where art can work in partnership with others and also not burn out the artist in the process. Um, the other one is Kim Abeley's partnering, uh, she was commissioned, she's another visual artist, par partnering with the California Bureau of Automotive Repair. Um, and she was, Kim makes, um, one of the things she does is she makes smog collector plates. I don't know if you've ever seen these, but they're, she invented this process where she takes a ceramic plate or a surface and cuts out a stencil and puts it on the surface and leaves it out in the smog for a certain period of time and the particulates in the air drop down on the plate and after a period of time she lifts off the stencil and there's an image. And she got real famous I think in the 90s or 80s when she w made the presidential smog collector plate series where she made one president's face per plate and depending on their environmental record, she left the plates out longer or shorter periods in the LA smog. And she, um, so when you, lift, when you saw the plates in a gallery or museum, you could see whose image was dark or light and you could tell what was going on. And there were quotes. Lot, but the reason I bring up this story is because the Cal she did that first and then the California Bureau of Automobile Repair commissioned her to help them with their, their um, smog check campaign. They called it vehicle emissions campaign. And, um, and so she, Kim made these sculptures out of catalytic com converters and mufflers, and they were sort of ugly and wacky and very funny, and put them all over LA, or at least Santa Monica, and did smog collection on it. And, um, and so all was going very well, and then suddenly she was gonna be sued by a congressional, um, by a congressperson for using this tiny little bit of um, money for this frivolous purpose. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because of impact, because most artists don't have money to actually document or, or survey or evaluate what they do. They barely have enough money to actually do the project in the first place. But this is kind of backwards evaluation where, so Kim was gonna get sued, she didn't have money, so the congressperson went to the Bureau of Automotive Repair, they have money. So they um, did all kinds of research to see what the impact of this was and that it was not a frivolous use of money. And it, Kim said as they were walking up to the courthouse to argue the case, they were told the case was dropped and they couldn't figure out why and they found out probably what happened was that the lawyer for the congressperson found out what the automotive repair people found out and that is that um, this 
little art project had an impact of some three million people learning about it um, through the newspaper and media and $30 million worth of in-kind advertising because of all the press that came out about this project. Um, and it was considered to be the, the most successful media awareness campaign in the history of the state ever. And so, so when I think about this little, and I think the grant was maybe $3,000, and when I, so when I think about you know, how can we as artists, without compromising what we do, um, really leverage what we do to have some kind of collective impact that is extraordinary without sacrificing the integrity of the arts, but really collaborating in an allied kind of relationship with other fields. Sorry, that was so long. So, uh, oh, April, yes. Uh, this is not a uh, fully coherent thought, but I have a couple pieces that have been floating around, um, partly resonating with what Peterson was talking about around activism. Um, and then I think I was called to talk because you mentioned Harriet Beecher Stowe and there's this weird connection to that. Um, I'm thinking about how one of the principles of nonviolent direct action and the kinds of protest activism that people do is to dramatize the conflict, right? That, that a good action dramatizes the conflict and performs something about the solution. Um, and that, so, and I guess I w I've been really resonating with what people were talking about in the first, um, the first circle about um, broadening our sense of what, what drama is, what theater is, what performance is, and, and how it works in the world. Um, so really thinking about that in terms of activism and, and engaging people um, in dramatizing the problem. Um, and I, I guess the other piece I was thinking about was this insight from performance studies, actually, and I'm thinking about this book that, that I've read that um, has been very influential in my thinking that comes out of performance studies and actually has a extended analysis of Uncle Tom's Cabin from a performance studies um, lens. And she talks about the way that um, performance is twice behaved behavior, right? So this idea that you, you, you do something and then the performance is doing it again um, with a kind of intention. Um, and so I've been thinking about that too as I've been listening to people talk about uh, what theater can do and what theater can do in this kind of engaged, um, this engaged practice and listening to, listening to you talk about um, the processional project as well um, resonates with these these kinds of things. So mm -hmm. I really like this idea of empowering people outside of these gate-kept organizations to imagine themselves as, uh, as performers, as activists, as artists, as creators. Yeah, so I have, I said Julia, and then Catherine, and then Lani, and then Elizabeth, is that okay? Um, wow, I feel so full and appreciative, and I want to add a couple of examples that are woven into our conversation that's been going. And something that I was thinking about that came up in this inner circle is um, Xavier brought up um, the personal connection to the people in your community, and I know Peterson, I've heard you speak very um, eloquently and concretely about this as well, that um, climate is an overwhelming issue and topic for people, so opening up personal entry points, um, which is something that I've used in my work as a theater maker, um, specifically around food issues, um, and then tying into um, tangible how-tos to leave audiences with. Um, so I think about the audience experience when they come to a conventional theater setting or otherwise, um, but in my own play um, that I workshopped about food in a grocery store, um, I was thinking about what am I gonna leave the audience with? Like, food in a grocery store is one inch of the issue in food justice and climate issues. So um, something that I incorporated was a resource list that audiences could take, that were passed out by the actors as part of the performance that they could take away, have a tangible piece of paper with them um, to look up uh, and learn more, as opposed to, uh, and in addition to, a talk back with 
um, someone on nutrition and food policy and urban farming. So pairing um, a live experience as part of the artistic happening and also something tangible for audiences to leave with. Um, and the other thing that I was thinking about is um, on a community, working with communities level um, that I was, came up uh, and stirred up in the first inner circle um, is about who are the communities that we're talking to um, and how are we involving them. And one example that I just heard last night from a friend is um, in New Jersey, um, the government uh, at a suburb of New York City in New Jersey was trying to deal with a deer problem, overpopulation of deer. So the government hired um, sharpshooters to bait and lure um, herds of deer and um, the plan was that these sharpshooters would take out parts of this herd of deer to curb the overpopulation. Um, and this plan was sab sabotaged by local hunters because the hunters were not involved in the conversation that the government, the government came in and made this decision and hired these outside professionals. Um, so just to add that into the conversation about communities and who we're talking to and who we're not talking to. Mm -hmm. And talking with as opposed to talking at. Yeah, uh, yeah so uh, let's go to Catherine and then Lani and then Elizabeth. Um, yeah, I've was, I was been, been thinking about um, there's two links between the first conversation and the second and Roberta's um, comments about this burgeoning movement and not really feeling about it and when there's disruption happening and complexity, sometimes you, you just can't locate it. You don't really feel how active it is. And um, it's been really interesting over the last year at Judy's Bicycle, we've been starting to think about what that movement is. And there, there is this um, creative climate movement that we're describing as the seven trends. And I think many of the topics and the thoughts that have been coming out, can you see how they might be located. And so I just wanted to share what those seven ideas and trends are. So the first one is about the creative work and what we really are seeing is just this incredible increase of um, artists thinking actively in their practice about it. Um, in the UK, almost two thirds of arts organizations have are programming or planning on programming around sustainability and climate change. The second is thinking around activism. So you might not be the artist doing it in your work, creating the play, but you are actively engaging in, um, maybe it's divestment campaigns. There's a number of groups that are really, um, have a more activist response. Then the, the third um, thing that we've been locating and describing is institutional leadership, which I think is, uh, again, people have been talking about that um, and the importance that organizations have and how they embed um, sustainability and, you know, thinking about that it's not just the nuts and bolts, you know, we're talking about theaters and their efficiency and that's an important part of the infrastructure, but it's also those designers, those um, funders, the commissioners, the producers, um, the audiences. So looking at that emergence of, um, of organizations. And then the fourth is we've had is around design and innovation and thinking creatively about design and innovation. It's not just the materiality, but it might be, um, Peter and you were talking about um, theater thinking differently, new models and platforms. So we're thinking and, and trying to document and collect all the ways the creative community is um, designing and innovating around climate change. Um, the fifth, which I think HowlRound is, would fall into this, is around pathfinders, catalyzing organizations that are providing um, some stickiness, some space for convening and conversation and um, energizing people, giving space for reflection. So we're seeing that as a really important part of this creative movement. Then the, um, the last two are collaborations, and I'm gonna highlight an, a collaboration that I've been involved with for eight years, which could be really interesting to um, um, kind of explore. 
but that being really important, that collaboration, the networks, and, and so you don't feel isolated in how you're working, but you feel like you have peers and people that you can soundboard, um, amplify, and, and then I think this is where that scale and doubling the impact becomes really important because this issue is so systemic um, and uh, it's really important that it won't, we won't create the societal change without um, working together collectively. So that's really important. And then the, um, the last piece that we're really looking at is policy. Um, because it isn't around the individual, um, the individual practice, the individual organization, but it is about these kind of policy interventions, both within our um, artistic community, but these other sectors that are really important. And we're feeling, you know, it's just so critical. There's so much um, that the cultural creative sector can lend into this conversation, but may not be seen or be taken seriously by these other... Um, institutions and powers that be that we've, we've been talking about. Um, so I just thought that might be a helpful thing that we've been thinking a lot about is these seven ways and locating, because what we are seeing is it's transforming. You know, it is, it's, it's becoming a, um, and also I think if you, if one can visit, um, make it visible, then it become, become, can grow, it can, it can almost have that chaos theory that uh, kind of butterflying effect. Um, and then the, the collaboration that I, I thought I'd just throw in. So there's a, a group called the London Theatre Consortium, which is 14 producing theatres. And they've been working now together for eight years, since 2010. And they have kind of their eye on the prize a little bit is the 2025 20, London Mayor's targets to achieve a 60% reduction in um, emissions and impact. And so they've been thinking, and it's not just about the carbon number, but it's, it's thinking about them completely as their organizations, you know, every aspect and what that issue of climate change in London means, and how as 14 theaters, and you know, they've got the, the um, convenience of being in a place where they can meet together. But what's been interesting, it's the chief executives have been, they meet several times a year, where sustainability is the focus of that agenda, but then it's about empowering fully their organizations to, uh, through which to um, kind of interrogate and reflect and actively engage with this topic. Um, and so I really would love to talk more in detail yeah. about LTC um, as an example. So there's a, um, just want to lift up something that's happening uh, where we've, fallen uh, pretty nicely and naturally into this lifting up of bright spots. And uh, if you don't get to talk about something that you feel as though what is a bright spot that should be brought into the room, um, we're, we'll collect them over uh, on the board, too, because we're going to move out of this shortly. But, but post them over there if you know projects or ongoing networks or things that haven't been named. Uh, and then you know, part of this doubling the impact uh, question is probably where do we name them and why, haven't they, uh, why aren't they all known by everybody in the room who's already doing it? So there, there's a possibility of something that can happen. Uh, so the next, uh, Lani, Elizabeth, and then uh, Al Allison, and I think that might take us to the end. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to kind of state or ask two questions that have been, maybe it's two, I don't know. It's a little messy right now. But... Um, <laughs> So I, someone was talking about uh, working with youth and it got me to thinking about the work that we do with youth and um, an anecdote that led to a question with the anecdote being that I, we, uh, we have a program where we um, give students in Brooklyn tools to create plays about uh, the environment or climate and then uh, we produce them professionally because we want their voices to be kind of heard in a way that is respected and because they tell important stories um, and they have important things to say. But one of the, optical, one of the obstacles that we run into obviously is that uh, a lot of our, our regular audience is reluctant to come see student written shows. And then the other obstacle that we run into is that a lot of our regular audience doesn't want to come see a show that's free. And uh, I, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about how it's really hard as an artist to, as a theater artist, to live in a society where 
what signifies value according to the dominant ideology is how much you are willing to pay for it. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and theater in that regard is uh, not valued uh, in our society as much as someone was saying it's not seen we certainly aren't a very wealthy industry, of, even though there's you know, a lot of money in certain pockets. And I was thinking about that and about how um, I, as an individual, uh, do not have a lot of, I don't have a lot of money. <laughs> and uh, that is, relatively speaking, not true. Um, also, because I know there are people who have less. But I know that I, I, I don't have a lot of options in terms of um, how I can keep surviving, except for, uh, all I'm saying is that I, I depend on being valued in that way to continue to do the work that I do in order to make an impact. And, um, and I, my question is uh, to everyone, and we've already kind of been talking about it, but I just wanted to state it in a, in, and kind of ask for more wisdom from this group. Um, how, how do we uh, kind of subvert an economy and destroy uh, an economic <laughs> system while being dependent on it at the same time. And also, um, uh, and also, like, what can we do to make theater, uh, to use another dirty word, popular? Uh, and I don't mean I don't mean to debase it as people often associate that word with, but to really um, make it necessary and desired. And um, uh, and I think there's already lots of great conversation around that, but I just wanted to state those two things so that we could keep thinking about it and talking about it. Elizabeth? Mm -hmm. So I've been thinking about two kind of threads that came from the first circle, um, and then the second circle about asking um, specific questions about impact. So one of the bright spots that surfaced was this idea of um, these itinerant performances or things that are site specific or that are happening out of out of doors of traditional theater spaces and some of this is going to sound kind of like blasphemy because the theater as a temple like that's my church but i find that um and then that question about the the designers really actually provoked this which is the theater is the most controlled space in in, in a way that kind of exceeds other controlled spaces and so as artists, we rely so heavily on these on this space where we control everything. We control the sound, we control the light, we control when people can speak and how they can respond. This is an extremely indoctrinating kind of structure in a, in a little bit of, a, in, a, in a way, in a lot of ways actually, if you, in one way um, of looking at it. So I think that there is a great opportunity in this idea of site, what we call now site specific, which is what street theater, outdoor theater, which is as old as we are as a species probably. And I think that it all, it, there's a couple things that that practice can offer us. Um, one is um, taking back the commons, which I think is a really important action where we can, um, as artists that don't have money or can't get booked by presenters or um, find that we can do a show for a weekend because that's all the grant will pay for and then that was it and we will try and tour it but it may never happen again and site doing stuff out of doors or out of theater spaces really solves some of those problems there's a whole pile of other issues that mm -hmm. come with doing site specific work and that's where the designers can come in and if they think somehow that their work is going to be obsolete they are so wrong it, because there are so many opportunities for a good design to help site-specific um, spectacles happen. And, and that leads me to this, uh, this other idea of impact, which is, for me, when Xavier asked that question, like, what are, your, what are your desired impacts? For me, it's clear. I want more people to see the work, and I want to be able, as an artist, to do my work more. I want to do my show like if every weekend during the year if I can. I've never had that experience as an artist. I get to do it once or twice a year. And, it, and so this idea of scarcity of opportunity gets solved in a way. And, and, and the other thing I'll say that's just kind of another thread is something that Juleson said about the precarity of communities that 
are struggling to do to get day-to-day -day needs taken care of, and they, there's no luxury of time to contemplate the bigger abstract questions of climate change. And so one, I think one of the ways that artists can take some risks and also meet communities where they are is by leaving the theater and going and finding those communities. Again, like I'm not saying anything new. Um, and who here in this room hasn't said, oh, you know, we're having so many, many problems getting audiences to come to our shows. No one's interested in climate change as a theme. Um, you, you know, if I, if I have to book another show and sell another ticket in my life, I'm gonna kill myself. Like, I can't do another audience development project. Um, and so I just feel like this idea of moving our work into, the pub into public spaces or green spaces is to me feels revolutionary as an artist. Um, and it's not new, it's just pushing us to, to, to kind of radicalize our work in a way that feels like uh, um, maybe we're not doing enough of. So I would, that would, that's a provocation I'll offer. And, and I also think that there's something about working outside of the theater that makes you feel like you're not in control. And that that is, how a bunch of other species are feeling right now, that they're endangered. That's not how a lot of other humans are feeling right now, that they are on the verge of um, extinction. So Allison, and then we'll um, break. Uh, that segues into, ever, pulling on threads of what everyone has said, I, it's not because this has been in the news because two very famous people killed themselves this week but more because the study on the rates of suicide in the United States and just how dramatically the rate of suicide has risen, I, it's hard not to make the parallel right between climate change as a global act of suicide, bringing along, of course, all the people you're damaging <laughs> who may not actually be in a position of wanting to kill themselves, and yet somehow we as a species collectively are doing this. And so I think we when I'm thinking about impact and how we magnify it, I'm thinking about um, the ability of human beings to purposely self-destruct on an individual basis, on a community basis, on, a, on all the different levels. And I, I do think that part of our job in looking at impact is also looking at how we as artists provide comfort because it's so scary and obviously there are people who are traumatized and re-traumatized by so much of what we do and what we see and the, even the art we do. But to leave out that pot, the, the comfort means we're leaving people a little bit alone, perhaps more alone than when we, they came to see our art. And we don't wanna do that, right? And I do think that one of the ways in terms of the promises we're all making and what we wanna do is not just that individually our art can say that you matter as a human being, which obviously is incredibly important, but also part of the comfort that we can offer people is collective action, right? So, you know, we're holding out, we're holding out the promise of love, we're holding out the promise of individual love and collective love, but we're also holding out the promise of giving people agency to collectively move together, and that is one of the great antidotes to the despair that human beings so often fall ourselves, find ourselves in. All right, well, we'll take that into the break. <laughs> Jamie. Yes, 